All right, joining me once again here on The Matthew Filipovich Show is my good buddy, Steve Horn. Steve is an investigative journalist whose work has been seen in The Nation, The Guardian, Center for Media and Democracy, and more. He is a research fellow at The Smog Blog, which you can find at thesmogblog.com. You can also follow him on Twitter at Steve A. Horn. Steve, thank you so much for being on the show again. Great to be on. I just learned that this is my 20th time on the show, so it's an honor to come on every time. Actually, Thanks, yeah, yeah, Steve, this is your 20th time. You're actually the guest that's been on the most because you, you because you always have the depressing, depressing climate news. Uh, and so we're going to talk about some depressing climate news today. So um, over the holidays, uh, there's actually a bit of news that went fairly unnoticed at the end of 2015, and that is that the crude oil export ban, which has been in place for 40-some years in the United States, has actually been lifted. So initially, tell us about the ban itself and how it was actually lifted. Yeah, and so uh, as you mentioned, the ban has been in place for over four decades, or had been since 1973, over four decades. Uh, and uh, it was a slow but sure lifting of the ban. Uh, the year before, uh, at the same time of year, at the end of the year, the Obama administration did a slow uh, lifting, kind of a, a, a launch, a test launch, if you will. Beta. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, of, of uh, something called light oil or oil condensate, which is not quite crude oil, but it's uh, lightly refined and then sent to the global market. Uh, that of course, took place, but that it was not a wholesale lifting. The next year, that happened, and it was placed, as you mentioned, in the, in the budget bill, uh, a provision within this very long budget bill. Uh, it did actually did uh, get reported on quite a bit in the media. The problem is that it happened at the same, it was happening and unfolding at the same time as the Paris Climate Summit, and so I wouldn't say that it was front page news. I would say if you're paying attention to climate and energy, it's still Paris was. But this was taking. This was the biggest thing taking place in Washington D.C. at least on climate energy, as the Paris Climate Summit was going on. And then, right after Paris ended, uh, within days, uh, this thing was signed into law first by Congress, and then President Obama signed off on it. And of course, there's much more in a budget bill than just uh, oil exports. And so, but the, the you know uh, Harry Reid tweeted. He said, "Well, we can either uh, get this thing in there, and we'll have." Uh, extensions for tax credits for renewables and the oil exports or neither of those things will be in there and so there was this dichotomy set up that in order to get renewable energy and, and tax credits for things like wind and solar they're uh, attached to that had to be oil exports so it was either both of those or it was none of those and that's what ended up taking place at the end of the year do you buy that argument i mean obviously the republicans do control both houses and so the the, the truth is they there is a certain level of they do have a lot of power when putting in all this stuff just to, to make anything. But, uh, you know, in a certain way, again, like you and I have talked many, many times, and I actually kind of want to even get your opinion on just your kind of overall opinion of the, the Paris Agreement. Um, you know, this is just seems like another example of the sort of Jekyll and Hyde of Obama when it comes to climate, because like he'll, you know, again, like in my opinion of Paris, it's like I, it doesn't nearly go far enough. I'm glad that there's something that happened because at least the ball is theoretically moving a little bit, right? I mean, I'd rather have something than nothing at all because at least, you know, it's probably easier to keep things moving forward than to just flat out go from you know zero to 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 you know what we need to be. But it's it, this this seems like another clear example of of the Obama administration again, like saying that they really care about climate, but at the other time, just, you know, going along and, 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 and making it theoretically worse because really we should be, we're going to be exporting oil while we're trying to stop keeping all this stuff in the ground. It, it seems completely, uh, it's, you know, opposite sides of something to me. Well, very little changes from the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, at least as of now. I mean, uh, and that was by design. The United States and other global powers said, hey, like, we, we agree to this agreement, uh, or we, we'll come to the table, we'll talk about this, but we will not agree to anything that's binding. We'll right. talk about goals and baselines and that sort of thing. And actually, some would say, well, they, uh, because of activists and civil society groups, that baseline has become more ambitious. It used to be 
uh, we will try and attempt for a two degrees Celsius rise in global temperature, and now it's 1.5 degrees. And so I think some would say, well, at least there's this baseline in place, and so it's something that, that uh, now we can hold governments accountable to, and I think that that's actually a pretty good argument. And then at the same time, I still say there's a good argument to be made that these countries can come to, you know, come to the table and, and say everything they want, but if nothing's binding and there's no, no enforcement mechanism, uh, you can say whatever you want, but if you're not actually going to change your policies on energy and behavior, then it's just pretty much a moot point. So I can see both perspectives. I think that at the end of the day, it will probably uh, matter most, like what, what grassroots groups are doing and what activist groups are doing going forward, and if they can actually hold governments accountable. I, I wouldn't say in of itself, just because governments said they were going to do it, that it's uh, any, you know, that their ambition, that they're actually going to be as ambitious as they say they will be. And then I think to get to your broader point, I think it is a great symbolism that everything I just said, uh, while that was going on in Paris, business as usual continued in Washington, D.C. on things like oil exports and other things that we'll discuss. But oil exports, of course, that is the centerpiece of you know, oil extraction from fracking is a centerpiece right now of the United States domestic energy policy. And I think that it is, you know, the, the things happening in parallel does symbolize that, of course, on paper, uh, you can say one thing about Paris, but... Uh, and, and unless grassroots pressure uh, you know, grinds that stuff to a halt, it's going to continue pace. Well, so just, just so people know, when we're talking about crude oil, what <coughs> exactly, can just let them, does that mean frat gas? What does that actually mean for the, this ban being lifted? What are we actually talking about here? We are in the United States talking about predominantly uh, oil uh, obtained from fracking uh, in North Dakota, uh, in particular, right? Uh, and in, in the Eagle Ford Shale down in Texas. So those two states are the biggest oil producers in the United States, and that's uh, those are fracking fields. Uh, this, those are the big ones, uh, and uh, so as I would say that this locks in place fracking uh, for a long time to come, for sure.